So, uh, which so way do you, we, we, we're, we're just, yeah, we're, where do you want me to look at? Everywhere. There are, there are places you don't even so want look to know. <laughs> so what's, what's wrong with you guys? I mean, that's the, I mean. Is that first question? Or that's we the first question. What's, what's wrong with you guys? Dropped I, on our heads while babies. <laughs> I blame him. One yeah. I blame Doug. No, okay. So you, we were talking, you were just talking about the fact that you, you have, you know, media that will go after so many things, conservative issues, right. I mean, even touch abortion, they may even kind of talk about the, the Planned Parenthood videos, but you, t you actually talked about what's going on with sexuality in America, yeah. and you did it in a pretty aggressive way, so what's, what's wrong with you? Why would you do something like that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Other um, than the obvious things right, that are wrong with you. Right, yeah, no. Um, this, this, this is a Christian show, so I mean, maybe I'll just get deep. Yeah. You know, I was, I, was, I was talking with someone who had kind of asked me some of the same questions about free speech apocalypse, and they had said, why this fight right now? Why do you want to go after this, you know? And, uh, and, it, and it got to a point where the person said, man, we just, we got to stay focused on the gospel. We got to stay focused on the gospel. And I think what you're doing is picking a fight, and your tone is not very gospel-centered. Um, and this is someone who I actually really respected, so I, I, I didn't just start flailing around in an argument. I said, um, if you want to look at the gospel, and Doug would probably do this better than me, and he might disagree because he'll be smarter in this category. But the gospel, um, if we look at the gospel and take a historical, whatever, all the words you want to put to how you read the Bible, grammatical, historical, whatever, blah, 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 whatever. The, the gospel came at a time when it was in direct opposition to a particular thing. So all the wording in the New Testament about Jesus and who he is, is in direct opposition to who everyone said Caesar was, right? Mm. So Caesar is Lord, you, you've even got things, I don't think it's controversial to say, you, you, you even have statements prior to Jesus being born about Caesar that are almost identical. So it appears to me God is going right after who everyone said Caesar was, and really how the, how the world treated um, its gods. Mm -hmm. um, and so you had, to you, you had to deny Caesar, right? And it's all loaded in that. It's Caesar, it's the gods, it's all this, and Jesus is the one true God. Well, today, um, there is no Caesar in the sense that it was in the New Testament, but there's always a God of the age. And the God of the age right now is all, is all packed around sexuality. It's all packed around um, tolerance, diversity, and, that, and that's all just language for you need to be able to serve a God that says you can have sex with anything, anyone, whether it's dogs, cats, same sex, robots, whatever, you know. And you're not kidding when you say that. That's, that's, no. That's not an exaggeration. No, that's, no. Yeah, not, that's for real. No, not at all. So, yeah. so um, that's, that's where we are at. Yeah. And so for me, I was like, well, if I'm going to stay gospel-centered, yeah. and I wanted to make it all about the gospel, then right now, the way I stay gospel-centered in today's culture is going after, like, if, if this is my time of acts, then I want to go after the God that everyone's worshiping. Right? And everyone's worshiping this God of, you know, it's, it's a false God. Love means this, tolerance means this, diversity means this, and, uh, and, and sex is right at the core of it. And uh, so I went after it because it really is, to me, this is the gospel defining issue right now. Okay. There's, to add on to that, I would agree with everything that was just said. And in the, in the New Testament, the proclamation of the gospel always comes in two steps repent and believe, right. Right? right? Well, in order to say repent and believe, someone in the crowd is going to say repent of what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you mean repent? What it uh, means to turn away, uh, to change your mind, to be done with, well, we need a direct object. Be done with what? So you can't preach the gospel, which tells people to walk toward Christ, without simultaneously calling them to walk away from something else. Yeah. And that something else that they must walk away from is in our generation, in our era, sexual libertinism, sexual libertarianism. So, the, um, and this is the hard part because re preaching the gospel does not just mean telling them to repent of those sins that they know and acknowledge to be false, but it also means proclaiming to them 
repentance from things that they thought were their virtues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. so that's where the love, that's tolerance. That's tolerance, love, acceptance, et, et cetera. Uh, I'm not mean like you guys are mean. So uh, if, some, if I were talking to a non-believer and they, and they believe they've got a gambling addiction or they, they drink themselves into a stupor every night, yeah. oh, even today, even in this era, people know that that's a problem, right? Yeah. Um, and they might want to turn to Jesus to help them with their problem. Uh, and so you're telling them, to, well, no, it's not a disease, it's a sin and you must repent of it. Mm. But at least they're with you halfway. I'd like to get rid of this thing. Right. Um, the, 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 the world's not working out for them. Right. And they can see that and experience that. Right. And we're a long way away from that recognition with regard to uh, the orgiastic uh, approach to sexual, sex and, and sexual issues. So when people say, why are you picking that fight? Why don't we emphasize the gospel? They're saying they want a gospel that does not, does not go after sin, mm. that does not deal with sin, that does not name sin. But Jesus died for sin, and he died, died for sin, uh, Adam's sin, and he died for particular sins. And you can't be faithful to the gospel so without, with, without uh, uh, going where they're defending their right to not be repentant. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and that's, those are powerful points. And I think what's interesting is that here we are now, it's 2015, almost 2016. It's Christmas time, and we, you just released a film. And we're actually watching things on a screen that if you could take um, what was on that screen, right? Put it like, you know, take a, a computer back during the time of the Puritans, right? And you could, right. you know, you could go up YouTube <laughs> right. and, and show them what we were going to be facing. You know, nobody would believe it. Look, right. Like, look, look what actually is happening. I don't think a, two years ago. Yeah, in a short <laughs> space of time. I mean, 50 years ago, 60 years ago that we'd actually... I mean, there's videos, you can see the public service announcements about regarding homosexuality from the 50s that, you know, mm -hmm. they, they saw it as a very, very serious issue. And here right. we are with, in such a short period of time. We're facing it in such a way that it's just embraced. So, um, <clears throat> so you guys did a, did a film about it and you come <laughs> right. after it. And there's, some, and there's another element to it. It's not just... Uh, God identifies this as a sin and they say, no, it's not. Underneath that is their claim, uh, their postmodern claim to be, to be able to rename the world. Yeah. They, they want the authority to say that anything can be anything else. And that is a claim to they're aspiring to deity. Yeah. And, and, and so the Christians who challenge that are gonna be the Christians who are in trouble. Right. And the Christians who want to stay out of trouble are the ones who know that you must not challenge that. Right. So how do we get here, though? Because, we're, I mean, knowing history, knowing what the Christians believe that came over to this nation, knowing what um, affected the culture, was just sort of in the atmosphere. Right. Right. And so what, what happened? Well, I know there's lots of answers, but... Lots, what? Of, lots of answers, but the, the fundamental one is... Schofield Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> that's a symptom. Uh, that, that's a symptom. Okay. But, but uh, it's a closely related thing. It's the myth of neutrality. Okay. Right? So what began in the founding era as, hey, let's not get into denominational distinctives. Okay. Right? Let's not, uh, let's not have a national church. We won't have a church of the United States. Mm -hmm. Because at the time the Constitution was adopted, nine of the 13 colonies had state churches, mm -hmm. right? You had the Anglicans here and the Congregationalists here, and you know, so you had state churches. And so we didn't want a church at the federal level because if you have a state flower or a state bird, that doesn't cause wars if the national government adopts a different flower and a different bird. Right. But if you have a state, state approved denomination of Christians, and the federal government has a different one, you're setting yourself up for conflict. Okay. So they said, we will not have a church of the United States in the First Amendment. We will not have a church of the United States the way there's a church of Denmark and a church of England. And well, hold on, this is really weird because, because the way that I was taught in my training was that no established religion meant that God stays out of all of our affairs, like right. you can't bring that in. Right, and, and that, is, that was part of the sleight of hand right. that got us where we are. Yeah. Because they have said, what they're saying is separation of church and state, yeah. which I don't have a problem with. Right? Me neither. Yeah. Uh, right, yeah. uh, in fact, I would say that that's a Christian development. That's right. Uh, so um, there was, in, I think it was in North Carolina, 
in the colonial era, they had a, there was a law that if you were an elected, re you could not be a minister or an ordained minister and be an elected representative, right? right? Because right. of separation of church and state. But in order to hold office, you had to be a baptized Trinitarian Christian. Mm -hmm. Right. So all office holders had to be Christians, mm -hmm. but they couldn't be representatives of another government. The, the you just couldn't be a really smart Christian, <laughs> <laughs> really studied. Yeah. No, you couldn't be a Christian who had been set apart to another task. That's right. Uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, so you had when you're separating governments, church and state, great. Mm -hmm. But that's not the same thing as separation of morality and state or separation of right and wrong and state, mm -hmm. or separation of God and state. Mm -hmm. that's a com so that's a completely different issue. Right. And so what we did is we moved from uh, the federal establishment of denominational neutrality. Yeah. Muslims were not a factor, there were a handful of Jews. You know, the, the, most, the most extreme outlying group were the Quakers, right? right? Mm -hmm. So that was, that was as far out as it went. And so the federal government said, we're, we're going to be neutral on denominational distinctives. Okay. And that gradually morphed when we weren't paying attention, we weren't paying the kind of attention we should have been paying to, into um, anything that has any religious motivation at all is not welcome in any way in the public square. You must shut up. Yep. Right. If, if you're a Christian appealing to scripture or, you know, and, and that's how we got that's how we got gamed, mm -hmm. right? And, and it really was, uh, I've, I've wanted to- But is there a move there? We, 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 we got gamed there, but what was, is, is there an example of what the move was? Yeah, well, like, is the, it, the just, move is example. to say, what they, what they did is they said, do you guys agree to denominational neutrality at the federal level? And we said, yeah, that's a good idea. And it was. Okay. And then they changed, the, it's equivocation. They ter changed the terms. So what was denominational uh, neutrality turned into religious neutrality, mm -hmm. turned into worldview neutrality, turned into morality neutrality. Mm -hmm. so, so everything reduces now to Christians must shut up. Mm -hmm. That's the conclusion of every argument. Christians have to shut up because if you don't, <coughs> you're trying to uh, bring in your theocracy. I'm, I'm getting sidetracked in a good way because this is what I, what I think is no, good, yeah. classic and enjoyable Doug Wilson because a lot of things that I see you get in trouble for are, are things that, pe that, that people look at you and go, what, Doug, that little issue, just do just roll, this. or Just, just roll over. Just do that, yeah. but it's not even a roll over. Denominational, it's just denominational. And right. it seems like those are kind of things where you're, you're always looking to see where, where, where does that little thing that everyone seems to be asking for how is that actually going to be used right. down the road? And this is one of those things where, like in history, it seemed like no one did that because they thought this would be a great way to just to destroy our country. No. They thought it was a good idea. They thought it was a good idea. And a lot of the people who did it, did it in good conscience. I think they should have locked a few more doors, anticipated a few more uh, right. things. Right. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but I think it was well-intentioned. But you always have to be thinking three chess moves ahead. Right. All right. If you believe that we're in a spiritual war, as I do, you you can't assume that you're going to do this, and then everybody's just it's going to stay that way. Nothing stays put. Mm -hmm. And so what they what they do, what they say, is denominational neutrality. And I would have said, knowing what I know now, I would have said that sounds great. Let's not have a church of the United States. Let's let's have the established churches be at the state level, and <coughs> let's simply put a uh, clause in the Constitution acknowledging the universal lordship of Jesus Christ. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, so something. Some that would have rescued. That would have rescued, yeah. that would have rescued <laughs> so much. Right. Because then you would have had a reference point. Correct. That's the that's the whole point. Is that is the way the way that it sits. You don't have a reference point. There's no ultimate authority to finally stop that and go because him. Right. Right. And and and, and now it's well because us. Right. And that's what we say. Right. And there's no, and, and that would have rescued so much just to simply point to Jesus, which is what they were already doing right. on so many other levels. And, and the Christians, for, uh, yeah. to give them a fair shake, managed to hold it together, I would say, for 150 years, basically. Okay. Where um, the, America was a Christian nation, it had an informal establishment uh, of religion. So um, 
the Christianity was acknowledged as the faith of the nation. Um, Idaho was not admitted to the Union until they ditched celestial marriage because mm -hmm. that's not, not in keeping with our Christian values. And, and so uh, the, the move, um, the, the move that has got us to uh, the rabid secularism that we're dealing with now is a move that has happened within my lifetime. And, it, and they're, they're in the full court press now. At the, they're, at the, they're in a frenzy now, insisting on it, demanding, demanding it. But the pieces have been, been arranged for scores of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there was one part of the film that I knew, I knew what was happening. Okay. When it happened, and it, when, it, when, it, when it was put in the film, I thought, that's perfect. Like, I, I get it, and I'm so glad that you guys went there. And it was, it was interesting because, um, you know, as we promoted the film with Apologia TV and, and all of our listeners worldwide and everything else, people were loving, loving it, got a lot of good reviews, but it, we did have questions. Sure. What was the part about slavery? Like, what was that situation just thrown <laughs> in? And it was interesting because when it happened, I go, exactly. Right. Like, that was so important to have in there. Can you, so someone says they're confused though, Doug. Like, right. why did you guys talk about that? Why does it need to be in the film? Why was that such a big issue? Right. Okay, so talk about right, that. So this, uh, this is a, a basic street level apologetics issue. Okay. All right, this is very simple. If you find yourself in a discussion with any uh, non-believer today about homosexual issues, and they say, do you, are, do you mean to say that homosexual uh, marriage should not be allowed by the law, same-sex mirage should not be uh, allowed by the law because God said to Moses on Mount Sinai, you shall not. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, that, right. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly what I'm saying. And they, and they will say, but God said other things to Moses. Okay, so within 10 minutes, whether you want to or not, you're going to be talking about slavery. Mm -hmm. right? Within 10 minutes, they're going to say, but the Old Testament allowed for slavery. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament prohibited clam chowder. The Old Testament prohibited bacon, which is a that's it was a, a compelling argument. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we've all wrestled through that. We've all. Marcus doesn't anymore, but. <laughs> no, he had, I think, two, two slabs of bacon this morning. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's at least a prima facie case for them there. But um, <laughs> I vapored a pig. But, but with uh, oysters, no. Um, so, Amen. So you have this. Um, they'll, they'll say, Moses said other stuff. The Bible says other stuff. Okay? And th this is. Like I said, three chess moves, moves ahead. Yeah. If you're talking to someone about uh, the sinfulness of the homosexual lifestyle, they will say the Bible is not to be trusted as a guide for morality because Moses said that slaves, slaves could be owned under these conditions. And it doesn't matter how humane it is. Right? And the Apostle Paul returned Onesimus to, uh, to Philemon. And yeah. He tells in Ephesians, he tells the slaves to work hard for their masters. And, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter that he tells the masters to be humane to the slaves, but they're, they're right in the Bible. Now, as soon as they make that move, then conservative evangelical Christians start playing the that was then, this is now game. Yep. Right. And as soon as you start playing that was then, this is now, they've got you. Mm -hmm. Because two can play that, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Um, if, uh, if you get to s simply arbitrarily wave your hand and say, well, we don't have to take those parts of the Bible seriously because slavery, mm -hmm. right? Everybody knows slavery is wrong, and therefore Moses and Jesus and Paul are mm -hmm. all wrong, mm -hmm. right? Because of modern enlightened thought. As soon as you do that, they're going to start saying, well, why can't I reason in exactly the same way yep. with regard to my same-sex spouse, yep. right? And you have nothing to, uh, to uh, withstand them because you've abandoned the scriptures, and you are now you are now opposing them with your bigotries. You find homosexual practice distasteful, mm -hmm. personally distasteful, and that means that when they accuse you of that, they actually have a point, right? That's right. So, right. So the uh, sexual sin is not immoral because it's distasteful, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's immoral because God prohibits it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. right. So uh, there are many faithful Christians who walk away from various sexual temptations, and the reason they have to resist sexual temptations is precisely because they're not distasteful. They're attractive. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. And and so we have to have a, a ground for a, a ground of resistance that is that is 
uh, grounded in something other than our personal feelings. And so what this ha has done is knocked all your props out, and you and there you are opposing same-sex mirage because you don't. It's it because of the ick factor. Because it's icky. Yeah, because, yeah. And that's that that's going to last months. Not it's not going to last very that's long right. at all. The other thing, and this goes back to something that I think I I, I learned from my father, at least in spirit, if not overtly, and that is to have no problem passages a priori going going in. All right. So once the exegesis is done, once I know what the passage actually says, I'm not going to back off of what it teaches a millimeter. Right. So. Um, no problem passages. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to make excuses for Moses. I'm not going to explain Jesus' thought processes of why he was, you know, held by, held <clears throat> captive by some of the assumptions of the day. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, no, I'm a Christian. So if I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, and that means I don't uh, back away from the Bible mm -hmm. at, at all. Mm -hmm. And one time we were uh, handing out, there was a homosexual dance or something down, uh, downtown here. And so, some some of us went out down. So, so is the homosexual dance? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is there a dance going on somewhere? Yeah, yeah it's the old post office. Okay. And they were holding some some event, and so some of us went down there and were handing out literature outside. Mm -hmm. And one of the attendees was upset and called the Methodist min minister to come down and deal with us, to come down and argue. So he came down and he was talking with me, arguing with me, and he said, "So you're you're saying because Leviticus?" And I said, "Right." And he said, but God allowed for slavery in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, yeah, that's right. What's your problem? What's the point? And it, we were all done. Right? He, yeah. didn't have, he didn't have anything to say because that move almost always gets the Christians to run down the, uh, to run down the street. Yelling. Because God was, I know that God was really mean before, but right. he's so much nicer now. Right. Yeah, we got it. We adjusted his meds between <laughs> between Malachi and Matthew. Well, I think you learned that that move just gets you into the Methodist Church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, that's a, that. Okay, so so the point is, okay, so let's go there for a second because because a lot of people don't like to listen to the rest of the argument. Right. Okay. So yeah, God because God says that's my argument fundamental fundamentally. I've got all kinds of really great and creative external things that go on around this as to why it's bad for society, health reasons, the different stuff that happens with the destruction right. of the family. But fundamentally, it's because Jesus is the reference point. He's the center and because he says. Right. And so we go to his word now and we go, yeah, so God did have a form of slavery, not resembling what took place in Georgia right. um, in, in the Old Testament for the preservation of life and all the rest. But so we, now we start mm -hmm. explaining. So what do we explain? Uh, so, uh, so if they say, oh, I've never heard this before, are you, are you justifying vile abuse of slaves. Yeah. I'd say, absolutely not. That was a sin. God hates it. Yeah. He, um, he's going to judge it at the last day. Yeah. Uh, are you defending race-based chattel slavery? No, absolutely not. Um, that's, not uh, that's not a biblical pattern. Uh, and and uh, so one of the things I would do is I would distinguish the kind of slavery you have in the Old Testament where it's all under the law of God, uh -huh. where I would say it amounted to glorified indentured servanthood. Right. Yes. Right. So right. That, that's what you have in the Mosaic law. In the uh, New Testament, you're dealing with a different situation where the slavery, the, the laws governing slavery, were pagan and Roman, you know, Roman uh, law. And there, the Apostle Paul is giving Christians instructions on how to deal with it. Right. And I, and I would say that his instructions amount to here is a peaceful and godly way to subvert the pagan system. Mm. Okay, so we want to we want to subvert the system without a war. We're not we're not going to organize a riot. We're not going to uh, have a Spartacus kind of slave revolt that would be crushed. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to lead slaves and their masters to Christ. We're going to uh, teach them how to live in their station. In Corinthians, Paul says, if you have an opportunity for freedom, take it. Right, so right. it's for freedom that Christ has set us free, but we want to do it peacefully. And one of the one of the fun uh, things, and this is a, this is not a slam dunk thing, but I think it's likely. In Ephesus, um, within uh, at the end of the first century, there was a bishop in Ephesus named Onesimus. Mm -hmm. Okay, I believe it was the same. Uh, the Philemon's freed slave. Really? Okay. So um, 
Phil, uh, Paul returns Onesimus to Philemon and says, receive him back as a brother. Uh, uh, you, owe me, you owe me a lot, Philemon. So, I, you know, whatever he owes you, put it up to my account. Mm -hmm. So Paul insists that they reconcile peacefully. And I believe that that s sort of approach, uh, that kind of logic, eats out the whole system of slavery from the, in, from the inside. Mm -hmm. So when you, have, um, uh, when you have people who are, um, just don't know how to live their own lives, right, um, then you have to deal with them somehow, right? And, and this is another thing, this is just, uh, and the Old Testament law tells us how to do that. Yeah. Uh, there are currently in the United States about one million people incarcerated, mm -hmm. okay? They're slaves. The, right. the Constitution prohibits slavery except for uh, people who've been convicted of a crime. Mm -hmm. We have one million people locked up in dog kennels, mm -hmm. right? Right. And we feel good about ourselves because we can drive to work and not see them working in the fields. Yeah. Because we have them locked up in a dog kennel. Yeah. Right. That's we're more right. we're morally superior, mm -hmm. and 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 we have them there because some nineteen year old kid bought some pot. Yeah. Right. Man, I love Doug Wilson. Goodness, okay. Oh, it's Go getting ahead. good. Okay, so <laughs> slavery is inescapable. Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> somebody's going to be a slave. That's right. There's going to be because because not everybody is self-governed. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, some people are out of control and they they need to be taken in hand. And I'm not saying that we should let all the criminals loose. Right. But I'm saying that a million. Um, are you ser are you serious? A million uh, people, uh, and that's because uh, we. What do we call them? We call them penitentiaries, mm -hmm. right? Because we think the state is the savior. We think that we can lock them up in a dog kennel mm -hmm. that makes them penitent. Penitent. Right? We, for young kids, we call them reformatories because we think the state can reform the heart. The state can't reform the heart. That's right. The state can't give a penitent heart, mm -hmm. right? So what we do is we send these people off to grad school for criminals, right? Yes. To, in, or, in order to harden them. Yeah. Then they get released. They do it again. They, we send them back. Mm -hmm. If we apply biblical penalties, which would be, um, uh, let, let's say it's a, a punk who steals your car. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what, what we do now, a punk steals your car and takes it for a joyride and runs it into a tree. And then he's prosecuted. It's a felony. We, um, we send him up the river. And then we raise the taxes on the guy whose car was stolen to pay for room and board for the yeah <laughs> he gets robbed twice <laughs> he gets but, robbed twice but in yeah. biblical situation he would have to make restitution and it would have to be personal it would have to be right. personal unless the person said i don't want to make it personal he doesn't owe me anything right. but it but if you wanted him to come back and let's say there's a fifteen thousand dollar value on that car right he would have to work off the fifteen thousand plus twenty percent plus twenty percent and, 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 and if he became your slave just to keep it a fiery topic and not even get around the word if he became your slave mm -hmm. you you now have to interact with him mm -hmm. and you now have to look him in the eye you have to talk to him and that's going to change you and it's going to change him right right i mean there's that that's that's hard to get around because so, that, that, that would change society. So, so you drive it down to the, down to the, the heart of it. Uh, every fallen, screwed up society has slaves. All of them. We're no different. Yeah. And so the, my favorite question is, by what standard? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have slavery, by what standard? Who makes the decisions? Is it impersonal and bureaucratic? Right? Yeah. Or is it personal? Right? So if someone... If would you someone, say joining the military is another form of that? Uh, it could be, it, it, you know, if it was voluntary, no, no. But if, let's say, a judge gave someone an option, right, right. right. Um, but I would, I would. But haven't you told people? Haven't you seen people in your life and say, I just, Doug, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, right? And what's your advice to them sometimes? Yeah, yeah. It'd be, you need to carry a rifle for a while. You, right. You need, you need to go dig a hole, and you need to learn discipline, and. That, but also to have other people telling you. I've heard you say some people need other people telling them what to do. Right? And th that is exactly correct. So if you have a, if I've, one of my jokes is if I were president and what a glorious three days that would be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if I had the, the authority to, uh, I would let all sorts of people out of the penitentiary mm -hmm. as soon as they make restitution. If their family takes up a collection, they can walk, they can walk free, nonviolent, you know, sort of 
nonviolent property crimes. They make restitution. They put it right. They pay for their room, pay for their room and board, uh, pay the victim back plus 20%. You're free to go. Um, and and wh why are we trying to do things that the state can't do? Mm -hmm. um, only Jesus can. Only Jesus can do these things. Yep. And and so uh, what it boils down to is everybody wants to arbitrarily say that your, what you're defending is the worst abuses in South Carolina prior to the war. Mm. And I would say, no, I don't defend any of those abuses. I think God hates those sorts of things. I think they're evil. I think... And you, you, know, you actually said something that I thought was a powerful part of the film. I think it was in the film. At least it was in the, the, all the original footage. And when people started challenging you on this issue because they just don't want to listen. That's mm -hmm. our culture today. They hear the word slavery. They go, boom, gotcha. I win, you lose mm -hmm. because you use the word. Um, but the, 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 con the conversation of slavery comes up and you said, no, actually, I believe that people who kidnapped and enslaved deserve to die. Right. It's like, wow, that puts me in a whole new category because I don't think most liberals are even willing to say that slave owners deserve to die. Let's, let's lock them up for a while and make everyone pay for it, but let's not kill them. Duh. Right. Well, it, it, kidnapping was a, right. in Israel, kidnapping was a, uh, a criminal, uh, a capital offense. That's right. And so the slave trade off the West coast of Africa yeah. was, I think, a capital, I think, yeah. uh, I think trafficking in human souls in order to sell them like chattel was a capital crime. Yeah. And a just republic should have been uh, treated with the death penalty. Yeah. And, but, and, and what does chattel mean? Uh, like, like, um, uh, like livestock or, you know, okay. like, um, okay. so chattel would it, it'd be, it'd be a broader term. For, okay, got yeah. it. Because I, I hear chattel slavery of the South, but that, that just means you're just treating something like... So there's a, um, let's say you're an ancient Roman um, and a Greek prisoner who was highly educated was captured and you made him your house slave and he was the tutor of all your children. He was more educated than everybody in the house. That would not be a chattel slave. Got it. Right. He, he would be a, he'd be a slave, but not a, not a chattel slave. Got it. Um, so you have, um, so, so so that was vile, awful, but where does the word slave come from? Well, it comes from Slav, right? Mm -hmm. The Slavs are the ones who were picked on. That's, they, they're the ones who gave their name uh, to this. So while, uh, while slavery was, while the slave trade was operating off the west coast of Africa, that unhappy continent had a bunch of slave traders operating off the north coast. So the Muslim raiders would ra go across the Mediterranean. They would land in um, land in European towns, kidnap a whole village. They they would have there was one raid as far north as Ireland, where the Muslim corsairs would just land, take everybody captive, take them back to slavery in Africa. So there was a sl there was slaves being exported out from the west coast of Africa, and upwards of a million uh, white Europeans mm -hmm. being hauled into slavery. Um, to North Africa. Yeah. All right. So, is it too early to talk about reparations there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too soon. Right. Is it too? Yeah. Is, this, is too, this soon. too soon, Doug? Too soon. Too soon. Too, too, too soon, Doug. <laughs> so, just you, if if everybody what everybody wants to do is they want to make somebody. Or too pay. late. It's too late. They, yeah, too late. <laughs> yeah, not think, too late. I, I think it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> they want to make somebody pay. Right. Right. But, uh, but the only one who can pay <coughs> is Jesus. We can't unscramble the egg. We can't, we can't have everybody in the world. Okay, there's seven billion of us or more now. Everybody go back to where you should have been. Yeah, <laughs> fix it. <laughs> fix it. Yeah. That, that, that is literally trying to unscramble the egg. Yeah. We can't fix it. How many, how many tribes got ripped off? How many villages got raided? How many people spent their lives in slavery? How many people have been murdered? How many Eastern Europeans were displaced? What mm -hmm. did Stalin do? You know, this, this planet is one dark, sorry mess. And if you want to mess around the edges with reparations and th you know, things like that, it's, just, it's insufficient. Mm -hmm. You need something like the cross of Jesus Christ. Um, and the cross of Jesus Christ can, can tear down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. There was a racial antipathy. In yeah. there there ever was one. And it can do the same thing for whites and blacks. It can do the same thing for Middle Easterners, Asians, uh, Chinese and Japanese. You know, you can, uh, but if you're just doing the cool kid racial reconciliation thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, uh, the, 
cool kid. It gets you in all sorts of trouble. I, I had a friend who was telling me, he was in a church that he, for a while that was all about, all about racial reconciliation. And my friend finally sort of popped on them and said, "What you you you're you're all about recon racial reconciliation, but in your mind, in your yuppie mind, that just means getting together with black people and, and making friends with the cool black kid." And he said, "In your church, you've got all these Asians, you've got Chinese and Koreans and." Japanese and they all hate each other, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. all all you see is Asians, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and this is some. Uh, this is a point that uh, Tabidi has made, I think, very very powerfully, and that is we modern man thinks in racial categories, which is far more artificial than it's a biological artificial category, mm -hmm. and the real category is tribal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Chinese and Japanese and Koreans are all ethnic, are all racially Asian, mm -hmm. but they're tribally very different, and there are long-standing antipathies that go, yeah. uh, that go back. It's like a Scots, a Scotsman and an and Englishman. That, by the way, and that's way deeper than white black America issues. I mean, oh. you get around, you know, apologies to all my Asian brothers and sisters, but you get around Asians even in the church in you start talking to them, man, there is, it is deep in regards to woo, mm -hmm. Koreans with Japanese to the... My, bro my brother-in-law is... Uh, ties, I mean, woo, it's my gnarly. Bro my brother-in-law grew up in Turkey, Ar uh, um, and it was Armenian. He is Armenian, not Turkish. And the Armenian genocide is a... Mm -hmm. is a, a it's a, still... A, it's a sore spot down to the, down yep. to the present. Um, and then in South Africa, back when you had apartheid, all, all we could see here was, well, there's white people and there's black people. And if you knew anything about it, you knew there were three major black tribes and two major white ones, right? You had the English and the Dutch, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the English and the Dutch at the beginning of the 20th century had fought a fierce war with one another. So tribal antipathy is very much the center of our ethnic problem, and we are misdiagnosing it all the time because we think it's a matter of skin color. Um, it's, 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 nothing to do with, uh, it's nothing to do with skin color at all. It has to do with, uh, or minimally, you know, right. minimally so. Thomas Sowell wrote a great book, which I read decades ago, called Pink and Brown People. I think it was Pink and Brown People. And, and he, he talked about how if, if you want to make racism about skin color, the issue, you know, the issue, uh, Soul argued, why, why are all blacks from the West Indies, why, why are blacks from the Bahamas, uh, when they come to the United States, go right to the top, mm. right? They succeed, they're prosperous, they flourish. In a, ra in a, in a society where color <coughs> is supposed to be driving everything, why is, why is that? Why, why do uh, uh, people from the black people from the Bahamas succeed the way the Vietnamese do? You know, why, why is that? Well, it's because it has to do with things like culture and family and education and uh, and the cultural values of your mm -hmm. of your tribe, right? Right. Um, another great book is uh, Life at the Bottom. He's not a believer. No, uh, Soul's not a believer, as far as I know. Another non-believer who wrote a really fine book on this is called Life at the Bottom, by Theodore Dalrymple, and he was a medical doctor in London. <laughs> Um, which, by, which, by the way, I got the book. You only need to get through the first chapter, and it's it blows your mind enough just the first chapter really? to just put it down and go. I because he he starts that book, boom. Right. I'm a doctor. Boom. I mean, it. You get through the first chapter, you put it down, you go. I get it. So right. that's a that's a one chapter recommendation. Okay. Yeah. So then so then you look at you look at London, and you have what what, what, what he does is he describes. Every pathology that you that we can see in the American inner city, in the American inner city, it happens to be black, mm. right? But in London, all the same pathologies are there, and everybody's white, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the issue is the state. The issue is the idol of the state paying people to do destructive, uh, destructive things, paying them to live in a destructive way. Because the, and this comes back to Darren's first point: the state is no savior. The state is an incompetent savior. The state can't uh, can't be our god. Right. My my father's Mexican. He was in the military, 
and uh, I think they were going to Germany uh, at some point, and uh, they're going to a club to hear music. And uh, my dad tells a story that the guy said to him, hey, when we get to that club, if anyone asks you if you're Mexican, just tell them you're Cuban and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. But again, but that goes back. That's a tribal issue. That's not, so that, nothing with skin color. Right. Because huh. I don't really get along with you very well. <laughs> right. That's because I'm, <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I'm half Mexican. Yes. I'm half Mexican. So, okay. So now let's solve some problems. You're half ninja turtle. <laughs> yes. So, um, so the issue of s slavery comes up and then the Civil War comes up in the film and it's all about like uh, sexuality and then it's just uh, all of a sudden the state gets into the conversation. We're talking about the Civil War. It's just people, that's such a weird connection to make. So you've described the fact that the Bible has a way to end sla wicked forms of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, scripture gives us that. And, and you do talk about the fact that everywhere Christianity had influence in the world, Every other Christian nation did away with slavery without a war. A war, right. and so we fought a war and shed blood and killed a lot of people. And Christians killed other Christians right. in that war. And we think that's a bad thing. We want to say there probably should have been a better way to do that. Right. And people go, "You're, you're what? You, you think that was bad? Like we, right. like slavery is over." And it's such an awkward moment yeah. for people. It's a very weird moment at this time in history, especially when yeah. we, in our generation, we've seen some, we, we've seen a few wars now. Yeah. Right. And I thought everybody was anti-war. Right. <laughs> you know, even I was like pro the Iraq war. I, don't know, I just thought that's what we had to do. I was a conservative Christian. Because you're conservative. Yeah. I was like, yeah. Because America. Right. 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 America. And I, so, you know, I, I hadn't really thought through it, but all right. my liberal friends were like, war is bad. Right. All war is bad. <laughs> right. And then yeah. by the time, like, I'm like, hey, you know what? They have a really good point. Yeah. All my liberal friends from college, well, I didn't go to college, they went to college, who went to college were, were like schooling me. And yeah. then one day I'm like, you know what? They have a really good point. Yeah. These wars are really stupid. Yep. And you know what? That civil war is really stupid. Don't you dare. Right. <laughs> Don't you dare say the civil war was bad. <laughs> right. That war was fantastic. Yeah. So the fiery, the fiery fundamentalist Christian, and all of a sudden, Doug Wilson sounds like a woolly liberal. Mm -hmm. Like the uh, Civil War, bat. We should have thought of a new way to do that. Okay, so right. how would you, approaching it from a biblical perspective, how would you solve the problem of the Civil War? If you could go back and you could talk to people and you could have some influence, what would you have said to people as a Christian? I would say, um, if if we, um, if I were transplanted back with the advantage of hindsight, you yeah. know, who, what would you be appealing? To, what would you be appealing to people to, to do? Yeah. Right. Um, the, uh, I would say the central thing is that, generally speaking, the North was more, uh, the intellectual leadership of the North act actually was more Unitarian. Okay. The South was more Christian and Orthodox. So I would consequently have made my main appeal to the Southern, to the Southerners. Um, and I would say, if you want the Yankees to leave you alone on, on this, then you need to do everything the Apostle Paul said to do with regard to your slaves, Okay. right? You can't just pick and choose. So basically, um, my critique would have been leveled at the South more than the North because to whom much is given, much is required. Right. They, were, they were claiming more truth. They, and, and so consequently, I think they would have had to, uh, they had more to live up to. Okay. Or, 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 right. So I think I would have advocated uh, for laws uh, prohibiting the separation of slave families. I would have agitated for uh, the repeal of laws that prohibited slaves being instructed to read. You know, the, the, so it was against the law in many places to teach your slaves to read. I think that they should have been uh, pressed with their duty to evangelize their slaves, to um, <coughs> teach them the, the Christian faith, with a view toward peaceful manumission, with, right. a, with a, a view to transition uh, to the point where they're, Release. where they're released. Yes. Right. And and, and are no bloodshed. No bloodshed, and are prepared, and are, uh, and you've prepared them for that. So if I'm a Christian master in the South, and let's say I just walked into it, I, you know, I grew up, came of age. Yep. I inherited the plantation. Yep. Nobody asked me. You know, right. You, you inherited you, a moral mess. I, I inherited a moral mess. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, how do I get out of this? If you've got a grizzly bear by the ears, 
how do you get out without making a bigger mess? Right. And th the central thing is when you try to reform society apart from Jesus, you're just engaging in e social engineering experimentation, and you always make a bigger mess than you, you know. Rearranging the, furniture in a burning house. Good. Yeah, and, and on top of that, have you ever noticed that all the reforms that politicians call for now, whatever yeah. they're yelling for certain reforms, they're always yelling f to reform the previous wave of reforms, the consequences of the previous wave right. of reforms. Right. They don't know what they're doing. They're blind guides. They, they fall into a ditch. And so I would say uh, that to the, to the Southerners who professed Christ, I would say that you have to be actively, actively preparing your slaves for liberty. That means evangelizing them, g giving them every opportunity to, to worship, teach them to read, how to how to own their own land, um, how to, how to work businesses, their own, how to work their own land. Ba ba yeah, all yeah. Of, all of that. So yeah. um, where you and then you start giving. Uh, you start giving legal privileges, uh, uh, full, complete legal privileges, to free blacks who have their own businesses, et, right. you know, et, et cetera, and you prohibit uh, Jim Crow laws. So Jim, Jim Crow laws are uh, laws where the state comes in and forcibly requires businesses to not. Uh, so, for example, in Alabama uh, uh, a generation ago, the state said if you were a restaurant owner, you could not serve blacks and whites together. Mm. Well, I, I would say, what, what business is that of the state? Why is the state... Re it's uh, not their property. It's not, not their property. Yeah. Right? So had you... Um, so there are many legal reforms that you could have agitated for that would not have resulted in bloodshed. Yeah. Right? The, it would have been a political fight, not a... Um, not a man the barricades right. fight. So basically, the, it would have to be led by a revival in the church where the, the Christians who were part of the slave-owning system who had an uneasy conscience about the whole thing because it was race-based. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. so, um, um, so for example, if I said, uh, suppose I were talking as a pastor or someone counseling pastors in the South at that time, yeah. I would say uh, something like, so... Um, there's this uh, uh, cracker down the road, you know, who's who's every bit as much of a waster as, as this other guy that you're you're saying this slave that you own needs to be a slave because because mm -hmm. right he needs someone to take care of him. So that's why you justify it. So well, could we enslave that white guy down the road who's, not, who's living in that makeshift cabin down there? Can you enslave him? Yeah. Well, no, we can, couldn't do that. Yeah. Why not? Because he's white. Well, all the slaves in the Bible were white. Mm. Every passage, every passage you'd point to justifying slavery in the Bible, well, they were of no, white people. It's, white, it's of white people, <laughs> <laughs> right? right? That's right? So, great. so, so basically, you, you fight racism. You fight. Um, you fight those who would withhold the gospel from people. Yeah. You you fight coercion. Th those are the things. Th those are the battles you fight. Yeah. So, uh, and then you have the opportunity of, uh, of subverting the system. And I believe that this really would subvert the system. The Christian faith did, in fact, overthrow the Greco-Roman system of slavery. I think the Pauline system of subversion worked. It took, it took some centuries, but it, it did work, and, and it did overthrow the system. Then when slaves were, when the colonial age of exploration happened and the colonial expansion and then the slave black Africans were imported into the Americas I would regard that as a major backsliding of Western culture yeah right we we had gotten ourselves free of slavery and it was a major backsliding and I think we should have tackled the resultant mess the way we tackled it the first time but, but okay. this this where I kind of lose it and by the way I could use a trigger warning on cracker because of my past. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you're from California, and the crackers you get at Whole Foods are not, are, are not the same they're thing. Much more, they're not as white, they're much more diverse. They're expensive. It's got, the, it's got yeah. those sesame seeds in yeah, them. Yeah. It's not the same thing at all. Right. Yeah. It's seaweed and other. <laughs> um, I'm talking they're about. They're gluten free, though. <laughs> and, uh, 
and this is why he's a pastor, because he's gracious. Because I still think this, this, this whole conversation, the, the, the onus is not on this concept of slavery. Because every time someone talks about it, we, we act as if there's this line. And everyone's just on this side of the line. Mm -hmm. And there's all these um, able people who either have money or they have the ability to go and just purchase human beings. Yeah. And, and the assumption is there's, just a, there's, there's a continent somewhere. And there's just people floating around and you just kind of go there and get them and I guess what just frustrates me about this whole conversation is you get to the land where there are people to go purchase now, there are times where they did go in and just take people but everyone was taking people everywhere mm -hmm. I mean that's all there was that's all people did in the world so either, either you went and you stole people, and those people that got stolen either were stolen by other people too, or maybe they went when they had abilities to go and steal people. So people have always been stealing people. Mm -hmm. Or you have people who, with their own people, are selling their own people. And by the time you get to the slave trade, you have Africans who are making a really good business of going and rounding up their own people, their own tribes, and selling them. Mm. Right. And so by, by the time we get to um, here we get to America it's like the whole conversation is everybody's known from the beginning of time that slavery is bad and no one's ever engaged in it and then we get to America and this, and this experiment starts and we start it by saying we need to go get some slaves for us to really make this thing work and it's, and it's a new idea but slavery is the way the world worked it was the norm everywhere Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm still confused on why America, I think there's a, actually a good reason why America has to defend it, but why does America have to be the place that it has to be explained, it, it, it has to be given a defense of, the whole world was doing slavery. This was the norm. Why does America have to give the, the well, we're so sorry. Every other, every other place on the planet engaged in slavery. Right. So the, the natural pagan state is a slave state. So, yep. right, that's, that, that's, the, that's the norm. I can go to Dubai and they're enslaving people to build all those buildings over there. Right, so here's- That's uh, how they're uh, built. That's how they build everything in Dubai with slaves. I would say, um, I would answer you two ways, Darren. I'd say, number one, you're right that it is unfair. To, but I mean, right. whatever, I don't care secondly, about that part. The, uh, but secondly, it's right that it be unfair. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, in other words, when when some televangelist is caught, you know, this secretary, there's a great deal more hilarity right. than than there is when it's some uh, uh, the president of some green energy company. Right. 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 <laughs> uh, and it, <laughs> great dichotomy. <laughs> yeah. And so you you you've got these two things, and the and the reason is it's uh, Paul says in Romans is because of you that. Uh, your behavior that the name of God is blasphemed. So I, I would say that there really was an offense against our founding Christian ideals that were held up loftier than, look at, look at this. Right. And that was an invitation for the world to take shots at it, right? So, right? so it's so, a good thing that because of America being a Christian nation, how it was founded, it, it, it only seems right that this is the place, because this is the only place where we can have the conversation. Right. So, so ba basically, I think it's a con if it's a conversation that must be had, it's not fair, but we have to have it. And I think we should own our sins, and God doesn't grade on a curve. Um, so the, when we're called up before the Lord in the, in the great white throne judgment, he, we're not going to be able to say, but the, it was a lot worse in Brazil. Or, well, it was. It was a lot worse in Haiti. Well, it, wa it was. Right. But... Did you sin against the light that you had, right? And I think we did. So I think that the the institution of slavery, um, by the time war broke, I think I think we would have had war between the North and South had there been no slaves. I think it was about competition for land to the West. Um, the North and the South were culturally different enough without slaves to come into conflict. Um, the slavery thing was dragged in later to give a, a moral veneer to the whole sure. thing. 
Um, so I don't think the absence of slaves would have meant the absence of conflict. But with the presence of them, I think there was enough behavior there to discredit those whose profession was much higher than their, their action was. Mm -hmm. At the same time, five-fifths, uh, excuse me, five-fifths, um, uh, five, <laughs> all of uh, yeah, we've, <laughs> yeah, <whole> <laughs> so, so could you go over that whole thing? <laughs> five-sevenths, five-sevenths of the anti-slavery societies prior to the war were in the in South. In the South, yeah. Right? So um, basically, I think that uh, peaceful abolition, right, uh, peaceful abolition uh, by means of gospel, by gospel means was the way to, was the way to go. Yeah. So this gets into the big punch here, but just I want to end it with this. Is racism wicked? Yes. It's a sin. It's a sin. It deserves death. Um, well, I would say it depends on what you do with your racism. Okay. Right. So, and it, so if you're saying deserves death before God, yes. All, yeah. all sin. But yeah. yeah. All sin is worthy of death before God. Yes. I don't think someone should be executed by us for being, of course, yeah. for being a racist. Yeah. But if their racism leads them to certain crimes like kidnapping or, or murder or violent assault or whatever, yeah. then I think, yeah. Yeah. So we, we could uh, address the time period that we're talking about. We could say, well, here are some biblical ways that we can handle this. Obviously, obviously with the gospel, people's hearts need to be changed first and foremost. We can do away with slavery and with, with, with a gospel mindset, with, right. uh, with thinking like Christians once and for all. Um, and we should have anybody that's involved in this sort of uh, stealing of other human beings and enslaving them. They should be given capital punishment by the state. We should, we, that's how we solve those sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. And we can do it without bloodshed in the sense of the North and the South coming into collision with each right. other. Okay, but the discussion in the free speech apocalypse turned into slavery and then talking about the Supreme Court and the state, and that's somehow relevant to our current situation. And how? how? Right. So the, um, if you imagined, uh, well, first, if you imagined in 1950, oh, yeah. the federal government saying, hey, everybody, you have to let homosexuals marry. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. Can you imagine? Uh, right. It, it, it's just not possible. In 1850, you know, just impossible. It's just impossible. So if you get to a, get to the point where most of the country still opposes same-sex mirage, right? Yeah. Um, uh, the laws of 37 states were overturned in the Obergefell decision. So, and those laws were passed because of pressure from the people. So the, the, uh, uh, an anti-homosexual uh, measure was passed in California because uh, Obama's was on the ballot and the black population turned out and they have a very low view of, uh, of that. And yeah. so, so every, everywhere um, uh, th there's a fair political fight. The people who are opposed to same-sex mirage have done very well for themselves. Okay? Yeah. Now, when Obergefell, the, the Obergefell decision was handed down, why did all the people who opposed same-sex mirage at the ballot box and who opposed it successfully, why did they roll over? What, because the federal government said. Be <laughs> it's because they think that that's our system. They think that the Supreme Court is the supreme being. Yep. They think that the Supreme Court is, has the final say on things like this. And if the Supreme Court decides, well then, there's nothing we can do. Okay, now my point is that we got to that place. That w that's a sentiment about the Supreme Court that did not exist for the vast majority of the history of our country. Yeah. So the question is, how did we get there? Yeah. What, what, were the, what were the moves that, that persuaded people over time that the Supreme Court had the authority to determine what marriage was for all 50 states? And I, I don't see how you can answer that question without looking at, at the shift in the war between the states. Yeah. So, the Bill of Rights, the first part of the, the amendment to the Constitution, the, the Bill of Rights is all geared at restraining the power of the federal government. Yeah. Congress shall make no law. 
right? So all the restrictions are on the federal government in the initial amendments with the states as umpire. Yeah. Okay. So don't you do this and don't you do that. Don't you, you know, um, uh, don't you restrict their uh, right to bear arms. And, and the states are the guardians of our rights and the Bill of Rights. And the one restricted is the federal government. In the war between the states, and in the aftermath of the war between the states, particularly with the 14th Amendment the, and, the, and the court decisions that followed after about the 14th Amendment, the restrictions applied to the states now with the federal government as the guarantor. Okay, now, uh, another thing I should say is that it, I certainly believe that a state government can be tyrannical. Sure, yeah. Okay, so, um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have some sort of constitutional mechanism um, whereby other states or the federal government could intervene in a, ca in a case of a state level. Where sure. you split with full libertarianism. It, it, it doesn't solve anything to say, as long as people right. can do what they want to do, we're going to be just fine. Right. right. You just, I, I think that's incoherent. Right. And so uh, um, there was a shift as a direct consequence of the war between the states where uh, it used to be the people, uh, the Tenth Amendment said states not enumerated to the federal government are retained by the states or by the people. Right? So we were the guardians of our freedom over against the federal government and the federal government couldn't do these, these, ten amend these the things prohibited in these Ten Amendments. Now we look to the state, to the central state as the guarantor of our liberties over against what the county might do. Right? So the county might set up a Christmas um, nativity scene on the county steps, and, and the feds have to come in and, and protect me from that. All right? Or they might prohibit uh, a couple of dudes from marrying, and so the federal government has to protect me from that. Well, that shift is a profound shift in polity. It's just, t it's, it's a profound... It's not the way things were. Not the, things that, uh, not the way things were, and something happened that, to bring that shift yes. about. Yeah. And that uh, the main event was the Civil War. Yeah, that's powerful, and it I think it rattles a lot of people, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of Christians aren't aware of the implications and the consequences. And uh, you you said something that I I I, th I think needs to be heard, um, and I and it was almost like an aside, but it's such a big one. It's so mm -hmm. meaningful, and that's where you talked about how the ramifications and the consequences, all those things that occurred as a result of the Civil War has led to racial animosity and tensions that we're still still dealing with today. Correct. You just said it as an aside, just a moment, but it, it's so much because mm -hmm. we have so much today. Right now it's all about racial tension and it's about people coming into conflict with the police and it's because they're black and it's because of the white privilege and it's all these different things and you have the liberal, liberal professors saying things like, well, I don't want to have kids because they'll be given white privilege. Like, you know, just, mm -hmm. cr it's crazy. Right. It's so much, and, and you said, well, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, th that conflict. Right. Because we, um, the, our country was severely wounded at, in that, in that war. Right. And, um, our, our history was wounded, our people were wounded, our families were wounded. It was just, a, it was a terrible, terrible time. And wounds don't heal apart from Jesus Christ. Yeah. So there is no secular, so what it boils down to is if you look at, do I, do I think blacks ever get mistreated by metropolitan police departments? Yeah. Do, do I ever think that guys get, black guys get pulled over for driving while black? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, do I think that there are any uh, abuses of the white power system against uh, ethnic minority? Yeah, I think that happens, and I think and I think the sin goes the other way too. I you know I think the sin goes the other way too. I think there's black on white. Uh, um, I think there's black on white violence. I think there's black on black violence. I think there's white on black. You know I think you you've got all kinds of things like this, and I would say you can't solve the, that problem without preaching Jesus. You simply, you cannot, the, the, the secularists are impotent to make, they, they, they have no solution that will enable them to make ethnic groups stop hating each other. They cannot do it. That's right. Um, 
they could crack heads and bring a semblance of order. Yeah. Right? But everybody's still seething under the uh, under that rough justice. Yeah. You haven't you haven't fixed anything. And so um, if you look at the uh, it, we're like that woman in the Gospels. The more the doctors treated her, the worse she got. Yeah. Well, look at all the racial reconciliation that we've been going through, through my whole, my, you know, my whole lifetime. People have been pounding the drum of ra- racial <clears throat> reconciliation. And at the end of the time, people are more dag- daggers drawn than they have ever been. Yeah. Right? It's so your, right your, God doesn't, your God doesn't cut it. Your God can't do it. Yeah. Your God can't walk on water. Your God can't fix it. So why don't you cry out to Jesus? Well, I don't want... I, 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 right. Yeah. Well, I want to be... I want to love my... Uh, I want blacks and whites and uh, all the races to love each other. But if I, I call on Jesus, he's going to say some other stuff. Yeah. He has other things. He has other things. He's, he's, the, the Sermon on the Mount is <laughs> kind of pinches me at points. A bit. <laughs> um, so... Um, there's, there's an aspect to uh, what you do in your ministry and the things you talk about and the, film you, the films you make. We've talked about this. Um, <laughs> and to, to Apology or Radio that I think people capture uh, almost instantly. Like there's something different here, something very, very different. It, it looks like you talk a lot about like Jesus has something to say over this realm. He's allowed to talk to it. Right. And this realm and that realm. And he actually has something to say in the area of sexuality and even government. Jesus is Lord over that too. He's, he's in charge there. You may not know it or think it, but he is. Um, it, you have a view of, of, the, of Christ's kingdom and the future that is different in many ways than most evangelicals today in America actually think and the way they see things as actually being like, well, what are we supposed to be doing? A lot of Christians don't think you should actually really have to tackle these issues because Jesus has come back anyways. Right. And, uh, you know, re- yeah, it's bad, guys. It really is. But you just need to preach the gospel and, you know, hope for the worst. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. right. 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 So, okay, so talk about that for a second. You, you have a perspective of the world and Jesus' kingdom and his authority that really goes against much of Christian culture. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Uh, we, we, our tagline that expresses that or sums it up is all of Christ for all of life. Yes. All right. So and that's all, not just a pithy slogan. No, it, you we actually mean, mean, mean it. We mean it. Okay. So all no, of Christ. They, no, they mean that they, they hired a company, a PR company. There was a lot of time spent on that. Uh, we worked hard on that. Yeah, one. no, it's, it's, yeah. Well, we hope you like it because <laughs> it costs a lot. <laughs> so that's all five fifths of life. Yeah. Yeah, 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 five fifths. Yeah. So all of Christ for all of life. That means that Jesus Christ is Lord, means that He's Lord of everything. If He's if He's not Lord of all, of all, He's not Lord at all. Yeah. Okay. Did that cost you a lot too? <laughs> I guess that was. Good. I've, I've, that was <laughs> no, actually. But I, I, oh, I it's got, cost you. <laughs> yeah, it's cost me. The 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 first all of Christ for all of life is something that occurred to me in the course of an interview like this, I, and I just said it. If Christ is not Lord of all, He's not Lord of, uh, at all. Is something I heard from someone years and years ago. I don't remember who, but I think it's it's compelling. So <laughs> Jesus is uh, the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the center of everything. Um, in Colossians 1, it says he's the RK. He's the, he's the integration point for all of life. Okay. And if he's not that, then I don't want to worship him as my private dashboard Jesus. I, I don't need a private deity. Yeah. Right? Um, I need a God who is God. Yeah. And so um, if you say that Jesus is Lord of all, if you say that Jesus is the integration point of of everything. That means he's the integration point of all life, every human endeavor, every lawful pursuit. Jesus Christ is is the Lord of. And so... I just smile on this stuff. Because <laughs> you don't hear it a lot. You know what I mean? Like I'm sitting over here just getting giddy. Yes. You know, but, but it I... It makes I you want to fight. Well, no, <laughs> I, just, I just... But you don't hear people talk a lot about it. It's yeah. like... And it, it, it is exciting to hear someone and hear people say that because we... We hear so there's there's so many slogans we do hear in our culture today, yeah. but we don't hear a lot of that. Right What's now. crazy is because it's from the Bible. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And how, how, well, how can you argue against it? You're not well, allowed to as a know, Christian. Yeah, and and so what happens? And yeah. this this is something else I want to throw in there, 
nobody comes against nobody if someone's controversial if someone is well you're just picking a fight or you're just controversial nobody has ever said to me doug i i hate you because you love jesus so much or or i'm going to oppose you with everything i have because darn it you're just basing everything on the bible yeah right uh, the early Christians were attacked for cannibalism, for atheism, for incestual behavior. They, in other words, Jesus said when people slander you and say all kinds of dis vile things about you, they're, they're not going to say you're the best Sunday school student ever. They're not going to say, man, you read your Bible a lot. They're, that's not what they're going to tag you with. They're yeah. going to tag you with things that they made up or took out of context or whatever. You're going to get in trouble. So if, if you say that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, you're going to have a ruckus on your, uh, on your hands. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why people don't do it. They, they, um, they just say, man, that's, that would, uh, I, I would pay a big price for, for saying that and, yeah. sticking, and sticking by my guns. So it's all of Christ for all of life. He is the integration point. He is the Lord of everything. And that, that doesn't mean that I know what he would say about everything, but it means that I know, I know uh, who does know, right? Right. And, and he wrote a book, yeah. and I should give myself to the study of it and seek to grow in my understanding of it. Yeah. Okay. So, Jesus is, sit, is, is seated on his throne now. Right. Now. Yeah. And, and right now, 1 Corinthians 15 Paul's description of history going forward is that Jesus is seated on that throne now, putting all of his enemies under his feet now, and that when he returns, Paul doesn't say he's returning to bring that kingdom finally. He, he's he's going to deliver it to the Father. Correct. As a completed thing, all things in subjection to Jesus. Jesus, When Jesus comes again, he's going to put the capstone on. Yeah. He's building his kingdom now. Right. And the final piece is going on when he returns. And that final piece is the destruction of death. That's right. Every other enemy will be subdued prior to that time. Yeah. Right? Yep. And so Jesus gets to tell our government what to do mm -hmm. today. He because, has that authority. Because yeah. he's God. Because he's God. Right. And <laughs> um, there's, that. There, there's that. There's, there's that. that. <laughs> and uh, Jesus. Um, do you need more? <laughs> no, that, that about does it. Uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, and Jesus Let's has... Let's nine hours on 1 Corinthians 15. <laughs> yeah, we could. Uh, Jesus has something to say about Christians uh, in business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, Jesus has something to say about leaving legacies for your family. Mm -hmm. Jesus has something to say about how we live. Jesus has something to say about how we educate our kids. Right. And so um, I think one of the things that... Um, I mean, I, I, people say always, you know, Jeff, you're an optimist. You're just an optimist. No, it's because I believe Jesus is king and he's going to win. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I have so much faith. I believe that one day there'll be no more Presbyterians. And I'll actually, <laughs> <laughs> just, I had to say it. I had to say it. I no, think it's pretty no. good. <laughs> um, so, no, no. They, they, and people will say that about you and me both. I'll say, you know, it's just you're being so optimistic and you're not looking at the world around you. You're just not paying attention. You're in a burning house. You're like, everything's fine, guys. <laughs> things, are, things, are, things are good. Right. But that's not really true. It's not that we're just these hopeful, just optimists and we just see the glasses half full. It's that we believe that because Jesus is king, right. because he's reigning now, that means that certain things will be true about the world, mm -hmm. that he has the Father's promise, ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. Mm -hmm. We actually believe that that's actually meaningful. It means mm -hmm. something. And I, and I right. think the divide is, and this and is what... Incidentally, I, if you look it up in the Greek, nations means nations. Yeah, <laughs> it really means that. It's, it's so, in the Great Commission. Okay, but here's where the, here's where the, the divide starts to happen. People say, no, no. I this joke, so I'm just trying to hold <laughs> you're it holding it. <laughs> hold it. Feel free to lob it. <laughs> no, no, no. no okay. I was, I was, you um, said you're an optimist. I was like, but then why are you a delayed optimist? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Okay, but so, okay, so, so Doug, what people will say is Christians, and they say, well, yeah, he's king of kings, well, yeah, now, and lord of lords now, and yeah, he has all authority now, but, like, but not necessarily here. It's spiritual. Right. It's it, a, it, oh, yeah, it, what people want to do is say, yes, Jesus is triumphant, and Jesus has ascended the mount of all strength, and Jesus is the right hand of it. And you say, yes, and Jesus has authority over the politics of these United States. And they say, oh, you mean authority authority? <laughs> <laughs> you, mean, you mean actual authority? Right. Yeah. Well, that, look what you're doing. You're, you're putting Jesus in this invisible sky palace. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. You, and you've got him in this invisible sky palace where he can run, the, run everybody up there ragged because he's got true authority. Yeah. But he has nothing to say 
about us here. We will not have this man rule over us. That's not another eschatology. That's unbelief. Yes. But in fairness, pe people say, well, no, no, Doug, we're not, I'm not saying, I don't, I'm not going with your invisible sky palace. I'm just saying that it's a spiritual thing. Jesus is, in a spiritual way, he's, he's in charge of me. He's ruling over me. And as long as we get the me fixed, then everything else just gets fixed. Yeah, yeah well, but the, the point is, is what, what, do, what does that me do, right? Well, it votes, Okay. right? Runs for office. It uh, goes into dentistry. Goes into film. But I should wait until I get my, my, my family together, my, my relationship with my wife together, my kids together, and then, and then when I get my own house cleaned, then maybe I'll go and vote. Well, sure. Well, uh, okay, but that, I, don't care what, I don't care what order you do it in so long as we agree on the principle. Okay. So I, I think that people ought to get their households in order first. I, I, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think have you read anything? To, and I think, I think that you ought to have uh, the ch Reformation in the church before there's gonna be reformation in the public square. Okay. So I don't have any problem with the order that we tackle this in. I'm just saying, I don't want you to, in principle, take some area of human endeavor off the table okay. and say that we must never go there. Right, that's, that's the one thing you must not Because all spiritual whatever, whatever category you create for something being spiritual, it has to act out in, in flesh and, it's still, the great, it's the great commission flesh is, and blood. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? Therefore, go. So it's not enough. If, if we just go and send missionaries, that's disobedience. We're not, we're not allowed to just, we're not allowed to go. We're not allowed to just go. We must therefore go. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So if we therefore go, we go because Jesus has all authority in heaven and on and earth. And it's the only way we can go. All authority. All. If, there's, if, if there's any authority at all that's legitimate on earth, Jesus has it. And so we're not, we're, we are not organizing a political, Jesus is not running for president and we are not his campaign workers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He is a king. He has been crowned. He has been seated and we are his heralds. Yeah. So we are going out to all the hinterlands announcing to the villages what happened in the capital city. The king has been crowned. Uh, you're all invited to come along quietly. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, so but I, but I want people to hear this because we, that, that, that we say King of Kings, Lord of Lords means something. That's for real. In heaven and on earth, he meant that. He mm -hmm. really meant it. Over, all authority meant, means all. He's going to get all the nations, descendants of Abraham as numerous as the stars. That's a lot of stars. Right. And uh, we're not even close. Right. I think we have a long way to go. Right. Um, but Doug does, well, two questions. One, does that take place by some force and second called the holy spirit okay yeah. what do you mean force like you mean if it, well we're christians down, oh so so this is a political thing that's, doug it's it's just, force, we're just we're just we're just conservative we're just conservative american christians and we're saying america and jesus is lord over it and we're just going to take over just their political process no no dude. okay no. not not that not that so what um, How do we get there? It, we get, get there by means of evangelism and apologetics and preaching the gospel and, yeah. and planting churches everywhere. Okay. And that's, that's how this is okay. accomplished. Okay. So Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, therefore go, yeah. disciple the nations. So how do you do that? In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, you do it by planting churches, by yeah. teaching people how to live Christian lives, by teaching them to be good and godly tradesmen, yeah. by teaching them to be uh, obedient slaves who then subvert the system of slavery and they, they start making everything starts changing yeah as a result of these Christians who have their families put to, together and they start living in community as a new polis as yeah. a new city as a new way of being human yeah now when you plant these centers of churches these centers called churches which are sort of the pilot projects of a new way of being human and you plant them everywhere uh, it starts to grow and multiply, and the whole society is, tra is the whole society is transformed. Yeah. And eventually, the next to last thing that will happen is the laws will change. Yeah. So we're not saying we drop the laws on society. No. You. you uh, well, first, uh, it, it would depend on the law. So, for example, I, I would be more than happy to drop a pro-life law, stop the slaughter on America tomorrow. Amen. Right. Yeah. So there, there's certain things like that, but there there are things that uh, 
it would take a, a, a lot of reformation in the church before you got out to some aspects of divorce law or uh, inheritance law or sure. you know th you know things like that. Yeah. Uh, stop killing each other. I think we can I think we could do that right now. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So yeah. um, and uh, but okay, let me ask you this too cuz I got to ask. Ambitious. It. People people I, I'm, it's so great to have you sitting here right now cuz let's let's put this on record right now it would be perfect. So we talk about how this is going to take place. Jesus is Lord, it's faith in Christ, it's the gospel that goes out. Do you believe in salvation by works? <laughs> By, yeah, by Jesus' works. By Jesus' works. Right. I'm just going to ask you right now, sure. because pe people know my affection for you, and uh, you know a lot of things that I say have come from you and your, over right. the years, your teaching and everything else, and so I'm just going to put it on yeah. record right now. Okay. Is salvation through any other means than Christ and faith in Him? No. Uh, so the, inst the sole instrument uh, of our justification yeah. is our faith, and that faith itself is a gift of God, lest any should boast, Paul okay. says. So the, um, if, if someone is put right with God, he is put right with God because the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to him. Yes. Uh, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his work, his obedience, is imputed to me, and the instrumentality by which it is imputed to me is my faith, and that faith itself is also a gift of God so that I might not ever be tempted to take credit for that. So um, I, I believe that in, in Ephesians 2.10 it says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And right before that it says, we are we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. So we are not saved by good works at all. We are saved to good works. So the, the moment of justification has nothing, all I bring to it is death. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's the only thing I contribute. Yeah. So not now, not ever. Not now, not ever. No works. It's no Christ works. and His work. Christ alone. alone, faith alone, grace alone. Um, and, and but what people get the the thing that messes people up is that grace works. Grace is not works, but grace works. So when we're saved by grace, not by works, you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. The yeah. first thing that happens is you start doing good works. But you don't go ba ba to become a sheep, you know. Yes. You, yeah. you go ba ba because God made you into a sheep. Yes. Yeah. You don't. You're not a bramble bush that can grow an apple, and then God makes you an honorary apple tree because you grew the apple. Yeah. Um, he transforms you from a bramble bush into an apple tree. After that, you grow the apples. That's right. Right. Um, now, if someone doesn't grow any apples, then at some point you can say, I don't think you got turned into an apple tree. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you're saying you must turn yourself into an apple tree. That's right. It's all, it's, so um, it's sola gratia, sola fide, solus Christus. Amen. So this is, what I, this is why I wanted to say well, it. No one can ever challenge it now because he just said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're just pretending, right? When so, you say no. imputed. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is what's important. So I wanted to, 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 to say this. Here you have uh, Reformed Baptist, pastor, mm -hmm. Presbyterian, pastor, both with the view of Christ as Lord now and a victorious kingdom and that he has authority over every realm of life and we should actually live that way. Right. And that actually Christians, we get the world. Right. That Jesus owns it and we get it, right. it's ours. And we, we can be completely unified on those things and say it's the gospel that's gonna transform the world. As people are transformed, the world changes with mm -hmm. it, right? And so I think it's important for people to hear that. And I right. think, uh, I, I hope that helps. Yeah people to see there can be such a strong essential unity and in particular a strong unity around one of the core aspects of, of what's most meaningful and that's Jesus lordship and authority over every realm right and his victory right. exactly. so let's go all right right well I take the Bible literally yeah. and uh, <laughs> so I think God says that he's gonna bless his people to a thousand generations Oh, he's good. Yeah. So I think we got at least thirty-six thousand left. Yeah. <laughs> Years. Yeah. 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 I mean, so. You I, know. I I think we have a long time to go. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I I think future school children are going to be studying our era as part of the early church. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you there. I think we have a long way to go. Luke. Well, that actually leads right into my question. So, we're talking about being optimistic and everything, yes. and what the thing you'll hear a lot is, you know, especially with the film you just put out is. We live in a moral mess. The culture's a mess, you know. 
And I loved, my favorite part of the film was this, the little nugget you snuck in at the end during the credits. Yeah. Um, Thanks and, to Doug. I, I thought it was over. I'm like, movie's yeah. over. And Doug's like, it's not over. Yeah. And I was like, what? He's like, where's Jesus? I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. So you had an analogy <laughs> about a soldier in World War II, I think, yeah. in Normandy or something. <laughs> so I wanted to hear you talk about that because I was like jumping up and down in the theater when, right. when yeah. everybody else was like walking out. And I'm like, wait, 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 that, uh, that illustration uh, came from my dad's book. My dad wrote a book back in the 60s in, uh, called Principles of War. And, uh, and the illustration was taken from that book where you have a soldier pinned down under enemy fire on Normandy Beach and he can't get to the top of the next sand dune. And, and my dad said, well, let's make this ludicrous illustration. Let's say a, a page out of Eisenhower's master plan for invading Europe blows down the beach uh, and, it, and the soldier picks it up and it says invade, uh, establish a beachhead, invade France, uh, occupy Ber Berlin, right? This is a master plan. And the soldier is, could be overwhelmed and discouraged because he can't even get to the top of the next sand dune, right? Um, or if he's thinking rightly, he's going to be encouraged. He's looking up and down the beach, there are all the, the, there's a whole army here. I've got my objective mm -hmm. and I might die before I, I attain my objective I might be unsuccessful in my little tiny mm -hmm. thing but I know that I'm part of something way bigger um, people can lose their a man can lose his life in a winning battle you know right. it, I've often thought about this when nations go to war and then there's jubilation in the streets when the, the, enemy, the enemy country falls and there's jubilation in the streets, but you know there's grief all over the city of the rejoicing city mm -hmm. because of loved ones that died the day before that, mm -hmm. right? The, you know, the, you, you can lose your life in a, in a winning war. And, and so I think that we in North America now are pinned down under enemy fire. I think we can't take the, the next hill. Mm -hmm. And I think what we need is a good dose of reality. What, what's the master plan? Right. What, what's God up to? The master plan is to, uh, the, I, I think I say in the movie somewhere, that the Christian faith is a religion of world conquest. Mm -hmm. that, that's what it is. And, and so Jesus has done, he's risen from the dead. This world is a world in which someone has risen from the dead. Mm -hmm. That means you can't stop us. That, Amen. So how do we, I've got to touch on this a little bit, but how do we do this practically then, like, as we're hunkered down? I mean, it's, Jeff and I were talking yesterday, we're driving around, like, it feels different here mm -hmm. in Moscow. Uh, like, we're walking around with Darren, he knows, like, everybody in town. We're mm -hmm. sitting in a theater that your son owns. Right. Uh, Saint, or New St. Andrews College is across the street. Right. Like, it just feels you different have, here. You have people in your church that own businesses yeah. all up and down the street. That yeah. has been noticed by people who don't like us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it was awesome. So just right, practically, yeah. how do we apply all it this? It looks like you guys are investing yourself in yeah. this world. Yes. Which is kind of How weird. dare you? Right. You should probably stop that because things are getting worse. <laughs> yeah, things are getting worse. But uh, C.S. Lewis has a great essay called Learning in Wartime. And he says, if you don't, if you don't uh, give yourself to study culture, you're not going to have no culture. You're going to have bad culture. If you don't study philosophy, you're not going to have no philosophy. You're going to have bad philosophy. You're, you, um, so basically, our task is to do what we do. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. So if you're going to open a restaurant, open a restaurant to the glory of God. If you're going to do math problems as a grad student, do math problems to the glory of God. If you're going to be an educator, do it to the glory of God. So every lawful pursuit is a pursuit that Jesus can be Lord of and is Lord of. So um, I, don't, I don't think it's right to assume that if we have a, a you know, Navy Seals for Jesus movement, I don't think it's going to be a monastery with monks in their cells <laughs> saying prayers all the you know, I, I think it's going to be people doing, you know, raising families and planting crops and starting businesses and making movies and do, you know, doing all this. And, it ha and, and there has to be an integration point, and that has to be the Lordship of Jesus Christ because everything else comes apart in your hands. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned earlier, it starts with the self-government, then to right. the family. 
right. and out from there. Right. I was going to say too, like there, there, right. there's also a sense of, you know, they're, they're, you know, everyone makes decisions in regards to how they want to live their life, right? No one, um, unless you're under weird circumstances, you know, you know, looks at their wife and says, honey, let's, you know, let's, you know, let's, let's go find a church, you know, let's start three hours out. And we'll just work our way in. I mean, just it's just not practical. You just right. you just don't do that, you know. Um, and and so Christian living and is is a very unique thing. Um, you know, Moscow was designed back at a time you know when you know it was still you know it, this is this is a throwback to how places used to be built. Mm -hmm. You have a, you actually have a true main street. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a flat main street. You can go one town over to Pullman, and their kind of main street is hilly. Hilly, and so you don't. It's it, it creates different. It, it's just a different vibe, you know. You go visit friends in San Francisco. Just the way San Francisco is, it's it's crooked. Yeah, whole, crooked. That whole place is crooked. <laughs> <laughs> Everything, you know. Um, and so there's there's some geographical things that just are kind of old school here. You have a main street, and you have houses and suburbs. Uh, I mean, not suburbs, but you have divisions yeah. around it, and so. You, you actually, and I'm sure there's plenty of small towns across the country that have this where you're going to, where you see people every day, every single day. So that's, that's not abnormal in one sense. It um, is in Phoenix, I can tell you that. No, it is in Phoenix <laughs> and, 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 and Southern California where, where I was. So when, when you come here, um, there's, it's, it's not uncommon structurally how it's designed. There are places all throughout America like this. Mm -hmm. However, because of the structure here, um, and then you put that you have lots of Christian churches here, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, I have friends at the Church of the Nazarene, I have friends, you know, at, you know, over here, this church, um, you see them every day, and you actually know who they are, because it turns out everywhere you go, there are thousands of Christians everywhere. It's not a place you can't go on this planet and not find Christians, mm -hmm. you know, and if there isn't, uh, tell me where it is, I know people who will go there. So I'll just say that. Um, so when you're here in a small town like this and there are thousands of Christians, it's completely different than any experience I've had because it feels great to walk around Christians. It feels awesome. I like when I go to church. I like Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel good at church. I like walking down a town in, you know, in a town where I see hundreds and hundreds of Christians all day long. That makes you feel a certain way. It's just, it's fantastic. If I could add, add something onto that, part of the reason we're here, a cent central part of the reason this ministry is here, is I, I mentioned my dad wrote the book Principles of War, which is a classic. It's, it's still in, in print. It's a great, great book. And it's one of the books I read, read periodically because what he did is he took, he's a Naval Academy graduate, went to the Naval War College, and he took the principles of military war, uh, objective, mobility, surprise, concentration, uh, took all and then applied it to what he called strategic evangelism. Mm. All right. So, how do the principles of war apply to evangelism? And one of the, uh, one of the things that shook out of his thinking that way was, in the military, there's a thing called the decisive point. And a decisive point is has to have two characteristics. It has to be simultaneously strategic, and feasible. Mm. Right. So, um, if a if a a location is strategic, it's important to the enemy. If you took it, it would matter very much to them. And it's feasible. It's something you could take, mm -hmm. right? If, if you have those two things, strategic and feasible, then that's a decisive point. And my dad decided that in North, and I think he's right, in North America he said the decisive points all over the country were major universities in small towns. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the is so uh, the university makes it important, and the small town makes it feasible. So uh, this was back in, uh, so he found out probably in, he found out in the late '60s or early '70s that Moscow, Idaho, and Pullman, Washington, were two small towns eight miles apart, and they each had a major university in them. So he moved here. Uh, and, and he moved here to start a literature ministry, and because this is a this is a decisive point. And what what you're after here is what you and the reason you notice all the stuff you noticed is because of, of the phenomenon of disproportionate impact. Okay, so if um, there's a there's a town 50 miles east east of here called Elk River, 
um, or Beauville on the way there. Uh, it, we, that's a feasible target. We could round up a couple dozen Christians and take it for Jesus in two weeks. Right? Just all we'd have to do is move there. And, <laughs> but when, we're, when we were done, what we'd have is Beauville. Right? It's feasible, but it's not strategic. Yeah. Uh, New York City is strategic, but not feasible. Mm. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean Christians in New York City don't have anything to do, because within New York City, you, what they would have to do is zoom in and say, what points in New York City are strategic and feasible? So they, just, they have to think on a different scale. My dad was thinking on a national scale. He was saying small towns with major universities are critical, are critical towns. And so he moved here. And so consequently, the fact that it's, these are university communities um, that are small and vulnerable to a large influx of Christians mm. means that you have uh, an impact that's way beyond what you would do if you moved to an, another small town of, of a comparable size. Mm. Right? Yeah. And then just as it grew, obviously, I don't know, back then, when did the airport come in? The airport has always been there sort of as a putt-putt thing. Right. But that, even that's unique, too. You, yeah. you, you can get here. Yeah. yeah. You can get here. You know, it's not that hard. Yeah. You know, and so strategically, you, you have all those things. You can be here. You can still do work. You could fly and down to San Diego. And, you and, and, and one of the things that happened, another thing, is telecommuting, where we, as people started to move here, when, the, when something started to happen, and Christian parents would come here to put their kids in Logos school, or they'd come from the church and find out about the school. Or there, another unique phenomenon is kids come here to go to New St. Andrews, then their brother comes, and then their sister comes, and then last of all, the parents move here. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Right. So the the and the word I hear over and over and over again, the word I hear again and again is community. Uh, there's the, there's an actual functioning, living Christian community. Yeah. Which with uh, which has its warts and its problems and snar you know right. I'm, <laughs> we, I'm here <laughs> we we have community community um, so there there is there is that right yeah um, but it it is genuine palpable community that people are attracted to and as they've as they've come it starts uh, some of them have moved from California and they kept their job in California and they they're just able to telecommute. Wow. Um, and that was not an option when we, f when we first right. started, but it is now. And so there are people who, who uh, work in different places around the country. They telecommute or they travel, uh, you know, and, mm. and yet they bring up their kids um, here. And it's, it's just been a great, great And then you blessing. just have pure, just, just, just a, a, an, an industrious, robust approach to things to where you've, you've had church members because of believing this, believing Jesus, you know, has all the authority, can do all this, and we're supposed to keep growing. You've had church members actually have the kind of goals, like, I want to build a company here, and, yeah. and I want to have, you know, 50 Christians from, the ch you know, from churches around here employed here making $50,000 and up. Like, that was somebody's goal. Mm. Like, mm -hmm. very specific, you know. Which got attained. Which, so. <laughs> which, which got attained, wow. and now it's over 100 people, you know. So wow. you have... You have, you know, Christians here who, you know, have started a company, and when you have a Walmart, when you have a university, and when you're the third largest employer of people in a, in a town like this, because there was a particular Christian mindset that not just wanted to be industrious, there's plenty of industrious Christians, but this, but this kind of comes back to, I think, something that, that we all share. It's not just about doing particular things and doing, and doing the, the right things, and mm -hmm. Sai mentioned this and when we talk about apologetics, but why are we doing those things? Yeah. To what end? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, of course, every Christian would say, it'd be great to start a company and employ a thousand people. Who, who, who's opposed to that, right? But if you miss the but why and to what end part of it, then you're just, you're just doing it. Right. That's where I handed it to Doug to finish my thoughts because I don't know how to finish them. If you do that, you're just what? God, God Jesus Bible. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing it to win. Right. For, okay. for the glory of God. We're doing it to bring him ultimate glory and to, and to take victory. And it's a lot more fun. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's a lot more fun. The parties here are way better. Jonathan Edwards believed it. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah. That's what, what, what more do you need? What do you need more to believe? Well, okay, Bible. The Bible teaches <laughs> because it. Because the Bible teaches John, it. Jonathan Edwards believed it, and it is a lot That's of fun. a better formulation <laughs> than that. <laughs> That's I'm really encouraged to hear this because we're about to try to apply the principles to an island. 
Yeah, okay. we're planning a so church we're, in Kauai. We're planning yeah. a church in Kauai. Okay. And so we're trying to figure out the same thing, like how do we that, start a community? Some of the same here. reasons you talk about yeah. it as why well, we're Well, there's a great book I know you can get. Yeah. 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 Called Principles of War by his father. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Jim Wilson. It's a great recommendation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, good. Well, thank you. Thank you. So that was uh, Apologia TV in Moscow, Idaho. It's very Christmassy here right now. That's one thing. It's at Main Street. There's lights and there's snow and Douglas Wilson and uh, Darren Doan. And, and it's just been great. So Apologia TV, Moscow, Idaho. It's so actually the first kind of like real traveling on location when we've done with all this stuff. It's kind of exciting for you. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's, not, not, it's not collision. But, <laughs> well, not yet. But, you know, yeah. we're trying, Darren. <laughs> Thank you. Show some grace. I appreciate that. <laughs> all right. Okay. So we'll catch you guys next time.